got your Bible with you, 1 Thessalonians 5, and if you remember this week to pray, I'll be in Indiana, just a little north of Fort Wayne, take an early flight out uh, in the morning in about an hour, and then from Atlanta to Fort Wayne in about an hour's drive, and a couple hundred kids up there, so it'll be morning and evening meetings starting tomorrow night, and then uh, be back on Saturday for church here on Sunday, so if you would please pray about that, we'd appreciate it. Uh, very, very much. First Thessalonians chapter number 5, for some a very popular subject, for some an unpopular subject. Uh, many people don't like nowadays to talk about when are things going to wrap up and when they're going to end. However, if you're watching the news media, any at all nowadays, everybody is beginning to say something's going on. And you're beginning to see things begin to sort of narrow down. It's beginning to come to a point now where there's more than just one thing that's happening anymore. Used to, we'd have a little bit of a commotion, something unusual, be a volcano or be uh, the, maybe the uh, tsunami over in, I guess it was Sri Lanka or on the Christmas Eve, or maybe the towers fall. Some magnanimous event would transpire and everybody go, oh man, must be that the Lord's coming back. And by the way, He hadn't come back yet. If so, we're in trouble. But that does mean that he is coming back. Yeah, but the Bible says, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. We're not looking for signs in the moons and the stars, and we're not looking for Shemitahs and blood moons. But he does give us enough warnings, enough cautions, enough things to tell us, I don't think, to warn us as much as to excite us. Amen. I think it all has to do with your perception of when he talks about these things happening, how it is that you perceive those things. I think he's telling us to give us a heads up. Hey, when you see this, hey, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. And don't get disheartened, don't get discouraged, don't get depressed. All these things are going to happen. But guess what? Your redemption draws nigh. It gets worse here, but it gets better there. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is different than the day of Christ. We're going to talk about it in just a little while. For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them, not you, as travail upon a woman with child. Reference to Revelation chapter 12 has to do with the tribulation. They shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. And you're all children of light and children of the day, and we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse number 11, Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Brother Larry, you pray. Would you please ask the Lord to help us out? We will give you the glory, Lord, for what you'll do for us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I just wrote these few things down so that I wouldn't forget them. I think that in the last days, the way that we perceive things often comes from the fact that we lose sight of where our real future is, where it is that we're actually headed. We're not headed to just be put to bed with a shovel. We're not headed just for a hospital bed. We're not headed for a mausoleum or for an urn or any of those other kinds of things. We know that we're all headed for death, but for us to die is gain. Amen. And I think oftentimes that while death is a sad thing, and while it seems because we're more aware of it now, because it's talked about it a whole lot more, that the reason that death can oftentimes be depressing for us is we forget our real future is not here on this earth, and life does not end at death death, it actually begins. I think secondly, that we oftentimes lose our focus of what it is that we're supposed to be doing while we're here. I think that while we're here, we have to recognize that we're not just trying to make a name for ourselves, but we're trying to spread the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're trying to take as many as we can with us when we get ready to get on the ark. Sometimes the focus gets kind of cloudy. Would you agree with me? And sometimes we forget the foundation that no man can lay other than which is Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 3. The only reason we have any hope at all is because of what He did for us. Amen. Upon Jesus Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking stand. So we lose that focus. We lose the idea that the foundation is Jesus Christ. The world sinks around us, no question. 
Human beings are letting people down at a, an exponential rate now. It is moving so fast. Every day a new scandal is in the news and every day something has changed. If you keep up with it at all, I recommend one dose a week is probably plenty to keep you up to speed. Yeah. Uh, you watch that stuff every day. You get to thinking to yourself, man, it's not hard to get your eyes off of Jesus and get your eyes onto the rest of the world. I don't know about you, but I wish that the Lord would let us get out of here. Amen. I think oftentimes it causes us to forget who our real enemies are. Realize that our real enemies are not Russia and China and they're not, you know, Kim Jong-un flinging a nuke at us or back in the day Saddam Hussein who, you know, got caught in a spider hole and so on and so forth. I, I think oftentimes that we forget that our enemy is the devil. I think sometimes we forget that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, rulers of darkness in high places. Our battle is a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. It's easy to be distracted and all of a sudden lose focus on what it is that we're supposed to be thinking about. I think we lose what's our, our, our focus or our sight of what success really is. Amen. Yes, sir. Success is not necessarily what's in your back pocket. Success means when I cross the finish line, will Jesus Christ be there to give me gold, silver, and precious stones? I don't know about you, but I think we often have too much time to focus on our failure and foolishness. That's the end of my list of F's. But our failure and foolishness rather than focus on our finisher, the author and the finisher of our yes, faith. Amen. Amen. Let me show you, tell you this this morning. I'm going to do my best to preach to you about how close we are to the end. I believe that we're at the end of the rope. I believe the Lord could come at any time, whether by death or rapture. The question would be whether or not you're ready to go. Take your Bible, if you will, just a few places in the Bible this morning, about five or six of them, if you're going to uh, keep count of it. Look in 2 Thessalonians and chapter number 2. And we'll pick it up, first of all, in verse number 3. Signs of the Lord's coming back. In the last days, the Bible says, many shall depart from the faith. Look, if you will, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let me tell you why. People were saying Paul told them things he didn't tell them. And they were sending these letters in and telling people false doctrine and false teaching as if Paul taught it. And Paul said, hey, don't be shaken by that foolishness. I didn't send those letters, nor did I say those things. What they were trying to say is, is you've missed the rapture. You're going to go through the tribulation and things are going to get difficult. Look in verse number three. For that day, the day of Christ shall not come except there come one a falling away and two, the son of man, the son of perdition be revealed. You know what was going on in Paul's day? The same thing that's going on in the day today. The day of the Lord is the day that starts with the tribulation period. It's the day of the coming of the wrath of God. It's the day of the coming of the wrath of the devil. It's the day of the coming of the wrath of Jesus Christ. But He's not appointed us to wrath. So it's our day of escape. So the day of Christ is written correctly in your King James Bible. I don't care what theologian claiming to believe the King James Bible said. Well, a better rendering should actually be the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord may encompass the day of Christ. Or not. No, he said day of Christ for a reason. Amen. And the reason is, is because as time grows closer and closer to the end, ladies and gentlemen, the tendency is to think God forgot us. Well, He forgets your sins, but He never forgets you. Amen. He doesn't forget His promise. He is a promise keeper. The original and only promise keeper that ever was around is Jesus Christ. He hasn't forgotten you, no matter how bad things may get. But it had gotten so bad that even the pulpits were corrupt, and people were trying to undermine Paul's work with one of the greatest churches that was around, the church there at Thessalonica. As a matter of fact, when you get over into Timothy, you know what he says in Timothy? He says to Timothy, the younger preacher there, he said, listen, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and be turned from the truth unto fables. You're in the day now where there's no longer sound doctrine coming from very many pulpits. 
You're living in the day you have now seen or realized what the Apostle Paul was trying to warn Timothy about. Hey, guess what? There's going to be people that are departing. There's going to be seducing spirits that are going to come in. There's going to be people that are saved people that are not going to be coming to church anymore. Christian compromising. Church is compromising. And even the crowds are compromising. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he tells you that that day won't come except there comes a falling away first. Look, if you will, please, in 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter, go toward Revelation and back up just a little bit. 2 Peter chapter number 2. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jim Jones. Many of you might know and remember him from the late 60s and the 70s. As a matter of fact, he actually got his beginning as a preacher. And then over a period of time, he got so involved in politics that he was able to move the needle politically. And anybody that was a political mover and shaker got involved with Jim Jones. Jim Jones then got to a point where he saw himself as the Savior and took the Bible and said it's full of lies and it's full of deceit and he threw the Bible down and stomped on the Bible and cast it aside and he became his own authority. You say, why is that? That's where you are now. David Koresh, Jim Jones, people that heap to themselves individuals where they throw out the authority of the Bible or use the Bible as their vehicle to promote themselves and their beliefs as opposed to what the Bible says. Notice, if you will, 2 Peter chapter number 1 or chapter number 2 verse 1. But there are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now and for a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth not. It's a time in the last days of great deception. The time where people are using the pulpit and even using God's word to facilitate their own living in their own way. Look in Revelation chapter number 3. It's a very difficult time that you live in because now if you don't have a Bible to check who it is speaking to you, you can be easily deceived. I'm not saying that I'm the only preacher that preaches the truth, but the only way you can measure a preacher is whether or not he preaches the truth according to the King James Bible rightly divided. Amen. Any preacher in the day and time in which you live has to fall under the authority of God and under His Bible. And if he doesn't, then he's not God's preacher. Amen. And people say, preacher, that doesn't make a difference. It absolutely does. You don't follow a man, you follow the man that follows Christ. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You say, well, how do you know if the man's following Christ? That's why he gave you a Bible and told you to give attention to read and told you to study to show yourself approved. You can tell if a person is a hireling or not. You buy what? By whether or not they preach what thus saith the Lord. That's an easy, for you, easy thing for you to do. The Lord literally gives you the privilege and sit, respects your own intellect to say, hey, you should be able to tell yourself when somebody's pulling the wool over your eyes. I don't know if we have used car salesmen in here, and if you are, my apologies to you. But you ever notice when you go to those individuals, there's something about them that just makes you feel like they're not being forthright. Right? You know, hey, it's a one owner, you know, they kick the tires and everything is all really running good and all that kind of stuff. Maybe run the odometer back a little bit. And, but you have a sense in your gut, they're not telling you the, the truth. Oh, never been wrecked. And then you run the little fox thing on it and find out, man, it hadn't been wrecked, but it's been underwater for 10 days. <laughs> Came from the floods in Katrina. Right? The whole wire and harness has been redone and parts of it that make the engine run work, but everything else is on the blink. And that's when you walk in and there's duct tape across the entire dash because none of the lights work. <laughs> well, nowadays, you know what's happening. You're beginning to see the show and the sham in the pulpits. Yeah. And it's beginning to be, instead of about preaching, it's beginning to be about parties and about socials. It's beginning to be about entertainment. And now all of a sudden you walk into every church and you see big screens on both sides. Why? Make you feel like you're home in your man cave. 
Uh, listen, I understand their need or their understanding of that, but do you realize God was able to purvey the Word of God without television for a whole lot of years? Do you realize He didn't have to have electronic stuff to do it? I understand. I'm usually loud enough without the benefit of a microphone for people in the very back to hear from me. But ladies and gentlemen, when you walk in and you see that stuff here, it sets a mindset or a tone. And it says modernism in it. It says relax and come as you are and leave as you were. But when you walk into God's sanctuary, somebody's asked me on a number of occasions, hey preacher, you know pews are really expensive. They are. Why are you bringing that up? Well, you know preacher, we're going to have to have pews over there, but we could get chairs cheaper. No, 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 no. You're misunderstanding the cost of cheaper chairs. What you misunderstand is, is you're not looking at something monetary. You're looking at a mental attitude. You're looking at somebody. I'm not throwing off on anybody that has to have chairs. I understand that. But for us, ladies and gentlemen, a pew sets a tone. You are in God's house. You're in God's sanctuary. You're here to worship God in spirit and in truth. We're not here to play the modernistic game. It it's not a movie theater. You don't ever have to worry about your preacher playing a movie for the Sunday night service. It ain't going to happen. Now when I'm dead, I will haunt you if you try it. Time of deception is great. Revelation 3 verse 17 says, Because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind, and naked. You're living in a day of lukewarm Christianity, lukewarm commitment. You got the devil on one side of the fence and the Lord on the other. And when the devil comes, he takes those that are his. And when the Lord comes, he takes those that are his. And individuals will say, but preacher, I'm sitting on the fence. And the devil says, and I own the fence. The mistaken idea is, is that if you're on the fence, you're safe. No, you're not. If you're not saved, I don't care how close to the fence you are or sitting upon the fence. If you're not saved, you're on the wrong side of the fence. In the last days, it's this idea of, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. Great. Wonderful. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Why? Well, I, I give a lot to whatever I understand. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know how uh, 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 violently objective that is to people? Offensive is the word I'm looking for. It is to people nowadays. When you say, hey, that's great, wonderful. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Why are you asking me that? Well, I just want to know whether or not you're going to go home to heaven or whether or not you're going to go to your home hell. I find that people in the day and time that we live, this deception that hell is not real, it is not a literal place of burning, it is not a place of torture, I find the people that are trying to air condition in hell must be because they're moving in soon. No preacher worth his salt can get around the doctrine of hell that is in the Bible that tells you if you reject Jesus Christ, that is where you spend eternity. You come out, go into the lake of fire, and you burn for eternity. Preacher, that's unpopular today. You're in the last days. Sure, it's unpopular. You say, why? The same way Noah's message as it was in the days of Noah. Well, preacher, what does that mean? Noah, only eight were saved. You say, why? He was a preacher of righteousness. Over a hundred years he preached the same message. And he only got eight converts. As it was in the days of Noah. You live in a time of great deception. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Are you still with me in your Bible? You're living in a time of <laughs> demonic manifestations. If I've ever seen it increase, I have seen it recently. On a regular basis, I'm seeing demonic activity that is transpiring and taking place. And you just had an incident that occurred in, in Chicago. No, 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 look, I'm not going to get all political or anything else, but when you have pictures of an individual who's struggling with whether he's a guy or a girl or an in-betweener, and then you wonder why he murdered a bunch of people. He's not the one with the mental problem. 
You are. Amen. That's good. Something's you why aren't you amen in that? Amen. Something is wrong with you if you don't know something is wrong with him. Amen. Are you afraid to say he's got a screw loose? Something is wrong with him. Is it any wonder then that he takes life when he thinks that of his own life? That is the epitome of insanity. That is the epitome, the pinnacle of the temple of demonic entities that are overflying people. Oh, well, it was the vaccine. He hadn't been the same. He got COVID. He got, you blame it on whatever you want to. Here's the problem. The problem isn't what he did. The problem is how people perceive it. And nowadays, if a preacher says, hey, guess what? He's got a screw loose. That's hate speech, preacher. You can't say that. What if it hurts his mom and daddy's feelings? What about the people he murdered? You're, you're, you're twisted when you have been made to keep quiet about things that are definitely wrong. That's whacked out. But what would you expect? He's raised in a system that condones that kind of foolishness. First Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit speaketh expressly. Then the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Why? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Attitudes, ideas, aspirations. They're even trying now to use the church as their vehicle to condone things that are not just sexually perverted, twisted, messed up. If you're struggling with that here today, I hope you are uncomfortable. You are intended to be uncomfortable. You say, why? You are perverted. Did you just call me a pervert? Absolutely. Amen. Preacher, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. And you may let that pervert date your daughter or son because you don't know which they might be. You live in a day and time now where it has become so obsessive that they're bringing into the church this idea that it's okay to hook up before you get married. Shack up or crack up. And now what they're doing is your main religions are now appealing to the LBGTQ plus community. They're playing to their fiddle while Nero burns the whole town down. They're fiddling and saying, hey, y'all come on over here. We'll take you. Not here. Amen. Amen. We're not interested in you, pervert. They got a place for you called J I L. J A I L. The place with bars on it. Or the hospital. But ladies and gentlemen, you know what's happening now? People are not afraid. It's demonic. They're not afraid to tread on holy ground. They're not ashamed of their debauchery. They dare you to confront them. They stand up and offensively try to aggressively defend their position as if it's right. Take your fight somewhere else. We ain't interested. I'm not interested in trying to convert you. You're twisted. Well, preacher, I care about them. I realize that some of you have family members that are that. I understand. Pray for them. Say, but preacher, what if I bring them there? Uh, they may not feel welcome. Amen. Amen. Preacher, that ain't right. No, here's what happens. And here's where you just locked up on me. Now what you want me to do is give them special credit. Don't say nothing, preacher, about that. Because I got a queer with me today. And I want them to... No, I don't want them to feel comfortable. Well, preacher, I don't... No, uh, you ain't going to put me under that kind of bondage that if there's a pedophile that comes in here that I ain't going to shower down on it. That's how it's going to be. You say, well, but preacher, you know... No, uh, you're, no, no, you're trying to manipulate the pulpit. It ain't going to happen here. You say, why? We have a responsibility to protect what God's given us. Amen. 
I didn't say be rude or be mean or take matters into your own hand. I said that when it comes to that, you're not welcome here. We're not going to adjust the message to fit your perversion. You should feel uncomfortable. Great deception. Demonic activity and manifestation. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy, it's a time of real, sincere, straightforward danger. This ain't playing. What you're seeing in Chicago, Dallas, and Detroit, what you're seeing in Los Angeles and Atlanta, what you're seeing in Jacksonville and other large cities is simply a manifestation of the prophetic words of the Lord through the Apostle Paul when he was talking to Timothy. He said, hey, in the last days, perilous times are coming. What are the signs of those things? Perilous times shall come. The Bible says, verse number one, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. Good night, man. But he caps it all off with having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Perilous times, but can I say this? Permissive times. The attitude is, is that, hey, as long as you're not bothering me on my side of the street, we're going to stay quiet. Well, I'm sorry, that's how things happen and what happens when it becomes part of culture is because people stay quiet too long. At some point, ladies and gentlemen, some of you men, I intend to maybe get under your skin a little bit. What happened to your backbone? It turned from a saw log into a cotton string. And while I hear all the things that are being said about the women and how they're out of control, how about the men who don't have any control? There's no character nowadays. There's no standing up and I'm going to do what's right to do and we ain't doing that because it's wrong to do it. Well, but honey, everybody else does it. And you know, I mean, she has friends at school and he has friends at school and we have to learn to be more time. No, no, no. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. But boy, that sure has gone the way of the American Indian. You live in a day and time now where individuals have said, listen, I, I realize the danger's out there, but preacher, let's not make it bad on ourselves. Let's just be quiet. I think we should let them know where we stand. And then that way, I used to like the old saying, or the old thing that says, uh, beware. If you enter these prim premises, some of you know what that sign used to say. Some of you are like, what did it say? It would just say that they may have to carry you off the premises. You know why you put that out there? Because you believed in protecting what was yours to protect. Well, let me just say this to you, if I could please, with all due respect. Why are you so interested in protecting your own abode and you don't protect God's abode? Why would you not let filth into your house, but you don't care if it comes into God's house? Why do you not care who you be careful who you let into your house, but you don't care if they come into God's house? He said perilous times, but he also says dangerous times. Back to Revelation chapter number 3. Let's hurry. I'm saying I believe we've kind of lost our focus on where we're headed, but on what it is we're supposed to be doing. What are we supposed to be doing? Living for Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. That's full time. I, I, I mean, I don't, maybe y'all aren't that way. When I wake up in the morning, the fight starts. I have what wakes up with me, not my wife. She still does. She's usually up before me, already in there doing her thing. I'm talking about me. Wakes up with me every day. And the second I wake up, it starts on me. I got to go to the bathroom. Could you let me get my eyes open first? No, I need to go to the bathroom. You either let me go or you're going to have to clean up the mess. Now see, y'all aren't that way. You wait till you get old. You get that way. <laughs> You start looking at the aisle where you go, you go by and go, oh, those are terrible. Now you're like, depends for four ninety nine. dollars That's like, maybe one day, you know, should I get them and put them in the closet now for maybe later? I don't, I don't know. I'm just thinking, am I headed in that direction? You know what I'm saying? And, and then as soon as you're done with that, it's like, hey, I'm going to get, I want coffee. 
It's like, could you just give me a second? I gotta, don't have a coffee maker in the bathroom. Well, you need to change that. <laughs> when you get in the morning, you set a timer so that as soon as you get done with that, you can grab your coffee cup. Why? And fill it up again and go again? <laughs> it starts. I don't turn on the news in the morning. You say, why? I already have enough trouble with the sleeping giant. I know what he's going to do. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at this. Oh, look over there. Oh, I can't believe they did this and did that. I don't do that in the morning. You say, what do I do? i got to get course correction right off of Jump Street. You say, what do I got to do? My GPS is busted in the morning. You would think that it's not. And I wake up in the morning and it's like, you ever have that thing? Course correcting. What's that thing that it says? Recalculating. Why is it always a woman? But I'm glad now that mine's a woman. Because I wouldn't want it to be a guy. I wouldn't want somebody to get the wrong idea. Recalculating. Uh, no, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'd just soon have a woman tell me that they're recalculating. Because it's a normal thing. <laughs> There's a time of spiritual deadness. Look in Revelation 3, look in verse 14. The angel of the Lord will lay out a sea right. These things say at the Amen, the faithful true witness, beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot, and I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. A time of spiritual deadness. Liberal learning. Loose living and the liking of oneself over the loving of the Lord. We are there now. As a matter of fact, you know of churches in Jacksonville, and they are growing exponentially even after COVID. The churches are exploding with people. Oh yes, there's a number of churches that are shutting down, but there are other churches. But have you ever just looked into those? Have you ever just considered you go there and they got rock and roll? Here's what a guy just told me two weeks ago. You know what he said to me? He said to me, look, I go to this, and it's got numbers on it. And, he, and I said, okay, well, how are you liking that? He goes, the music drives me crazy. I said, okay, well, what about the preaching? He goes, well, they don't really have that. And I said, well, why are you going? He goes, well, at least they don't yell at you. I said, oh, I got you. Come on and I'll whisper sweet nothings in your ear. I don't want any of you men to think I'm queer. That's why I don't whisper. Whenever you have a guy that's in the pulpit and he's constantly talking with that tone in his voice, he's trying to get your wife or your daughter. He's getting too close to the cotton. He, he, you ain't got to worry about somebody like me. You say, why? You yell too much. Wouldn't nobody want you. It's a good thing you're married and she's true to her vows because wouldn't nobody have you. Well, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> but at least they don't yell. Are you a man? Yeah, right. At least they don't. I don't yell all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time. But ladies and gentlemen, you, you know what he said? He goes, I hate the music. They don't preach the Bible. Why are you going there? Well, you know, it's hard to find a church nowadays. You do know I'm a pastor of a church. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Good, I'll see you Sunday. No, I think I'll go back to the church of the numbers. Come as you are. Leave as you were. Enjoy the show. Man, he said, he said, pastor. Oh boy, here it comes. Whenever I hear that pastor, I'm thinking, man, pastor, do you know that they have campuses all across the county? I, I said, campuses. He goes, yeah, so people don't have to travel so far to go to church. It's just so convenient. You hate the music. They're not preaching, but it's convenient. Oh, I get it. 
Now, look, I'm in the flesh, so I'll just go ahead and tell you. So here's what I said. We stream our services live. He goes, not the same thing. Not, well, I guess not. But we don't have a campus. Amen. We got folks at home right now in their footy pajamas with their cinnamon rolls and their donuts and their hot chocolate. And they're kicked back and they're listening to the preaching. Some of them haven't even gotten ready to go to their own church yet. They're listening to us and hey man, why don't you tune in? You say, why? Because we're rich and increased with good. We don't need that. We live in this modernistic. We're more interested in the amount of people than we are in God being with us. Luke chapter 21, let's hurry. See, the idea or the attitude has been, the preacher, we're trying to draw people. Do you realize that flies are none too particular about what substance they gather upon? I said that pretty good. Sly, flies are none too particular about what substance they land upon. I have seen flies that look like raisins on a coconut cake. And I have seen flies on other substances. Equitable amounts. As a matter of fact, I've actually usually found more flies on inedible or unedible or should be unedible substances than I have been on coconut cake. So are you going to tell me that flies are the determining factor as to whether or not the substance is edible? I, maybe I know why they have so many flies. Maybe they're not particular about what they eat. Amen. That's right. Amen. Luke chapter number 21. It's a, a time of great distress. Luke 21, we'll pick it up in verse number 10, I believe will be it. Yep, then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Another passage in Luke, you know what he says in verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear, looking after those things which are coming on the earth and the powers of heaven are shaken. I realize that has to do with a period of time called the tribulation and the great tribulation, but it's a time of great distress, perplexities, pestilences, poverty. Yeah. You're there now. Yes, amen. I told you on Wednesday, if you ever want to find out how many people are actually dying, all you need to do is go look at the insurance statistics. Don't pay attention to the other stuff because they don't give you the statistics, but the people having to pay out of their pocket, when your loved one dies, they'll give you the right statistics. There's been an exponential increase in people dying. You say, why? You're close to Jesus coming. Preacher, what are we going to do? <laughs> you can't stop in the day thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. You're going to die. How about that for truth? You are going to die. If the rapture doesn't happen, everybody in here under the sound of my voice and listening out there is going to die. You're not going to change that. But all of a sudden, people become so possessive of themselves in their life. You know, if they begin to think, oh, what if, what if I die? I'm like, what if I die? Look, I'm not taking up or getting up a trip today. There ain't going to be no drinking, no Kool-Aid around here. But I can tell you this, for me to die is gain. And I just soon the Lord blow the horn and pull the, let's go, pull the plug. Go ahead and drain the swamp. Amen. No, don't go running off the deep end with that. But ladies and gentlemen, you know what he says in the last days? He said there's a time of, of great distress. It's, it, it's not, if it's not one thing, it's another thing. If it's not COVID and then gets you spun up about all of that, I don't care what side you're on. And then you come out of that and monkeypox. Or it's going to be war with Ukraine. Or now Russia. And we got subs off the coast. You've had subs off the coast. They're out there right now. Listen, I hear them. Beep. Beep. That's their sonar. Beep. They're watching you on both coasts. What are you going to do about it? 
I mean, y'all don't know it, we have a bullseye up there so that overhead they can see the bullseye so that if there's first strike, we get first strike and get out of here. I know you're not coming now. It's like, what better place to go than be in church? It's like, where were you at when the nuke went off? I was in church. Where were you? It's a time of great distress, isn't it? Uncertainty, unknown, not sure from one day to the next how things are going to turn out. Have you noticed even with kids nowadays? Used to be I'm grow up and go to college and I'm going to do this and do that. And now it's like I'm going to grow up and I hope I go to college and I hope when I graduate from college there's still a thing called work. But who knows anymore? Last but not least, if you would please, 1 Thessalonians 4 where we started. Here's the positive side of the message and believe it or not, I'll be done. When you begin to see these things happen, Titus chapter 2 tells you, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. You know what he says? That blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. For everybody else, it's all the other D's I gave you. But for me and you, me and y'all, me and yuns, it's a time of great deliverance. Because when you start seeing all this stuff spinning up, you know what the Lord's saying? I'm coming for you, honey. I hadn't forgot you. I know the world wants you to think I forgot you. Listen, I know when a sparrow falls. I know the number of hairs upon your head and when they all fell out. I know everything from the Alpha to the Omega, the beginning and to the end. I promise you, I'll not leave you. I'll not forsake you. I promised you that I'm with you always, even to the end. So Paul is preparing them there in Thessalonians, and he says to them, he says, Brethren, I know you're worried and concerned because these lying jerks are trying to tell you that I forgot you because you're having a hard time. Thessalonica was being persecuted, put in prison, beaten. They were having their families taken away from them and pulled apart. They were under tremendous pressure. Paul even says about them that despite your tribulation and trouble, you're still ministering to other people that are doing other things. And Paul said, that's an amazing thing. You got enough of your own trouble, but you're always looking out for somebody else. And then he says, in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, but he says, hey, I don't want you to be ignorant. The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to be with the Lord. Here's what I like. To be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be. It's not just a temporary thing. Now it's not like, hey, I take you up and then I'm going to let you down. It, it's a permanent thing. I'm going to be with the Lord and so shall I ever be with the Lord. I don't have it all figured out, but that means I'm not ever going to have to worry about not seeing Him no more. I've never seen Him. I've seen what people paint as pictures of Him. But in my mind's eye, I think about Him oftentimes. What He's going to look at, He must be a whopper. He's got to be big for everybody to be able to see Him descending from heaven with a shout. And there he is, and we all see him. He's got to be big. Yeah. Bible says he wears the universe. He fills heaven and earth. He must be big. I don't know if it's because we're transfixed. I don't know if it's because we get supernatural eyes. I know that the Bible says that we'll see him. I'm not talking about the second coming. I'm talking about the rapture. Two different things. The second coming, I'll be riding with him. The first coming, I'll be coming to him. Rapture, he doesn't come to the earth. The second coming, he comes to the earth and I come with him. The rapture, I leave. The second coming, he comes. And he said, wherefore, in light of all this stuff this loud mouth has told you today, comfort one another with these words. Then he follows where we started in 1 Thessalonians 5 telling you, hey, listen, they're going to be in the tribulation, but not you. 
and they're going to have trouble and peace and they're going to say peace and safety and oh man, I mean it's going to hit them like a woman fixing to have a young and but not you. And they're of the night, but not you. And they're ignorant, but not you. You say, why? Because you're already gone. That day will not overtake us as the thief. You know why? Because we're going to be up there with him. And the day that he comes at the second coming, you know what he's going to say? Y'all ready to go? Here's the problem that I've yet to figure out. I know we're going to be in complete submission and subjection to him. But once we get there in his presence, I'm thinking, no, I really don't want to go back. Now, see, y'all are like, oh, yeah, I want to ride the horse and I want to come down there and I want to wait around, wait around in blood. I mean, I've slipped in that before. It's not really like, it's like, you know, yeah, but blood's going to be the horse's bridles and we're going to kill all these people and, yeah, it's going to be really great. And I'm like, I think I just, Lord, can I just stay up here? <laughs> Let me know when you got it all cleaned up. <laughs> I know we're coming down here because he's going to get what's his and I know that we'll... But, but I just wonder if I could just for a minute to get you to think about what it would be like to be sinless. Amen. Amen. What it will be like to have a perfect mind and a perfect body and to never have any more worries or pain or trouble or complaints or sickness or disease or death. I just wonder if you could grasp for just a moment why I might say, you know, can we just build three tabernacles and camp out? I'm, I let them have the, I don't, who cares what they do? Could you just like, just create a new one? The Lord said, no, I'm going to come back because I redeemed that one. But you know what he says? He said, you ought to take comfort. You say, preacher, you just painted a really bad picture. I know. Isn't it great? I just gave you the headlines right out of the Bible. Isn't it great? You say, what does it mean? Look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. Just a reminder, just to help you not to get so focused here that when you see these things transpiring, taking place, you know what you can say? Oh, man, Gabriel's got the trumpet out of the case and he's licking his lips. He's fixing to blow the horn. Michael is fixing to shout. Gabriel's going to blow the horn and we're going to go right up through the ceiling. Amen. Amen. Last illustration, we were in a prison one time. I wasn't incarcerated there. We were simply there ministering. And the old preacher, he got preaching and he sort of got off the track about the Lord and Him being crucified, which was one of the messages he would preach there. And he got to talking about you know, I think the rapture is going to take place and I don't think it's going to be much longer and we're in a maximum security place. You could just tell the guys were really beaten down. I'm not saying they didn't deserve to be there. We didn't, none of us didn't agree they shouldn't be there. But he said, you know what, you guys are in here. He said, uh, you're not going to go over the fence, but there's going to be a major escape. And boy, you could see him. He said, yeah, you're not going to go over the wire. You're going to go slap through the ceiling. And it got quiet. <laughs> and one big old black guy said, that sounds like a winner to me. <laughs> he said, preacher, can you tell me when? And he said, not soon enough, brother. Well, bad for him in prison. That's been a number of years ago. But I can tell you this, not soon enough. Amen. It's only going to get worse. Cheer up. It's going to get worse. You say, what? That's the Lord giving you a heads up. Hey, Amen. it's getting worse. You need to get ready. Yeah, it's getting worse. You need to get ready. Father, would you please bless your word this morning? Thank you, Lord, for reminding us the importance of these things to hold on strong in these last days that we might be able to do what you've called upon us to do, that as a church we might be a burning and a shining light to an otherwise lost community. Lord, bless these folks and comfort them as they go through troubles and trials and difficulties and problems. And I'm not making light of that at all. I know they got real honest-to-goodness trouble. Would you please bless them and watch over them? We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.